Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to discuss what you need to know about ankylosing spondylitis, including risk factors, pathogenesis, signs and symptoms, and how we diagnose and how we treat ankylosing spondylitis. So what is ankylosing spondylitis? If we were to look at the words in more detail, ankylosing refers to stiffening or fusion. That's what ankylosing means. And if we were to break the word spondylitis down, the prefix spondyl means spine and itis means inflammation. So ankylosing spondylitis is essentially a fusion of the spine due to inflammation. But more specifically, ankylosing spondylitis is a chronic seronegative inflammatory spondyloarthropathy. So a lot of words there. So it's chronic because it's a long lasting condition. It's seronegative because if we look at blood work, rheumatoid factor is negative. And it's inflammatory because this is an inflammatory condition involving inflammation of the joints. And spondyloarthropathy is, again, spondyl means spine. Arthropathy means disease of the joint. So that's what all that means. And ankylosing spondylitis is a type of axial spondyloarthritis. Now, interestingly, ankylosing spondylitis is more common in men compared to women. The ratio of men to women is actually 3 to 1. So this is a more common condition in males. And it has an onset in early adulthood, typically by the age of late teens to early 20s. It can be anywhere from 15 to 45. What's key to know about ankylosing spondylitis is that the majority of cases of ankylosing spondylitis are HLA B27 positive. So if we look at a patient with ankylosing spondylitis and we check their HLA B27 status, they're more likely to be positive. And this can be anywhere from 80s to 90% of cases have this positive blood finding. And this all ties in with family history as well, since this is a family trait. So the epidemiology of ankylosing spondylitis can be remembered by what we call the rule of twos. 0.2% of the general population has ankylosing spondylitis, so it's a rarer condition. 2% of HLA B27 positive individuals will have ankylosing spondylitis. So in the general population, depending on ethnicity, there's probably about 8 to 10% of the general population is HLA B27 positive. Only 2% of those individuals will have ankylosing spondylitis. So having HLA B27 positive doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to get ankylosing spondylitis, but majority of ankylosing spondylitis patients are HLA B27 positive. And the other part of the rule of twos is that 20% of HLA B27 positive individuals with an affected family member will have ankylosing spondylitis themselves. So it seems to be related to HLA B27, but also having a family history. All of this seems to tie together with your increased risk of getting this condition. So what is the pathogenesis of ankylosing spondylitis? So as we mentioned before, there's genetic causes, but there's also non-genetic risk factors as well. And this all ties together with gut microbiome alterations. Very interesting. So when these two combine together, they lead to the activation of lymphoid cells. And these lymphoid cells can migrate to the axial skeleton and sometimes into peripheral joints as well. So these are innate lymphoid cells that produce interleukin-17 and interleukin-22. So these are cytokines that can lead to a variety of effects, causing inflammation in the joints. The interleukins, along with tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF-alpha, are connected and they can lead to inflammation in the joint as well. There's also some interaction with cyclooxygenase enzyme or COX enzyme. And what's important with all of this inflammatory response is mechanical stress. So mechanical stress on the joints, particularly in the spine and some peripheral joints, can lead to inflammation in those joints anyways. And with all of this pro-inflammatory response due to these migrated lymphoid cells, it gets worse and we get this pathological response being heightened and causing damage. So you might be wondering where does HLA B27 play a role in all of this? Well, HLA B27 or human leukocyte antigen B27 plays a role in this pathogenic process through its effects on altering the gut microbiome. So this is where it seems that HLA B27 is involved. It 
leads to alterations in gut microbiome that are necessary for the genetic and non-genetic risk factors to all come together and activate these lymphoid cells. So with all of that inflammation in the spine and other joints, we go from having healthy vertebrae to inflamed vertebrae. And eventually, if the inflammation is not dealt with appropriately, we start to see progressive fusion of bones. And we start to see loss of the cartilage in between the vertebrae. What are some of the clinical features of ankylosing spondylitis? So the axial skeleton involving the spine is the most commonly affected. Particularly the most prominent symptom patients will have is going to be mid-low back pain. And the mid-low back pain is not like a lot of mechanical lower back pain that many patients will present with. It is inflammatory in nature. What does that mean? Well, they're more likely to have prolonged morning stiffness. So in the morning, when they first wake up and they try to get going, their back's extremely stiff. And this prolonged morning stiffness is greater than one hour. Mechanical lower back pain might have morning stiffness, but it's usually less than 30 minutes. So if it's prolonged morning stiffness of greater than one hour, it's more likely to be inflammatory in nature. Another key component of an inflammatory lower back pain is pain at night. So if pain gets worse and worse at night, it could be indicating that this pain is inflammatory. And what's also important to note about this mid-lower back pain and ankylosing spondylitis and inflammatory pain in general is that it gets better with activity. So at first, when you first start getting started, there's a lot of stiffness. There can be gelling, so stiffness when you rest for a while. And then while you get moving, that pain and that stiffness gets better. And that's actually a key component of inflammatory pain. Whereas non-inflammatory pain like other types of arthritis, like osteoarthritis, usually gets worse with activity. So this is a key defining or distinguishing feature of this type of pain. We may also see sacroiliitis, so pain of the sacroiliac joint or inflammation of the sacroiliac joint. This presents as buttock pain, so pain in the bum. And that pain can alternate. It can go from one side to the other or it can be present in both sides. We can also see neck pain. So this affects the entire spine, including the neck, and actually the neck pain can be one of the first presenting features of this condition. And because of that prolonged inflammation and the fusion of the bones, patients with this condition can begin to see decreased spinal mobility. They have a difficult time bending and flexing their spine. Now, although the axial spine is the most commonly affected, the lower extremities can also be affected with regards to the peripheral arthritis we talked about earlier. So the most common joints that are affected besides the spine and the vertebrae are ankles, hips, and knees. So with this condition, we can see arthritis of the ankles, hips, and knees as well. We can see enthesitis. So enthesitis is an inflammation of where the tendon inserts into the bone. And typically with regards to this finding, we see heel pain. So pain of the Achilles tendon where it inserts into the calcaneus. And we can also see dactylitis. So inflammation of the toes can be found as well. So because of all these features, we can have certain complications. And some of these include kyphosis. So what is kyphosis? So in a normal spine, we have normal curvature of the spine. There is cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, and lumbar lordosis. But with regards to kyphosis, we get an increased curvature of the thoracic spine. So there's an increased thoracic kyphosis, which can cause a lot of issues with the posturing of an individual. So their posture can be affected. If we were to do an occiput to wall test, so we basically get them to push all the way against the wall, there's a huge distance between their occiput and the wall. Whereas in a normal individual, it should align with the back. So we wouldn't have that huge distance. Other complications include spinal stenosis. So because of all of that inflammation in that fusion of bone, the vertebrae in the spine can become fused and enlarged and have syndesmoses form which can impinge on the spine itself, leading to spinal stenosis. And another complication is secondary osteoporosis. Because of all that inflammation 
and some of that remodeling we talk about, we can lose some of our bone density. So the bones can be more parotic or have osteoporosis. So if we look at a normal bone here, compared to osteoporosis, we can see the pores are enlarged in osteoporosis. What are some other findings? So these are more due to the inflammatory nature of the ankylosing spondylitis. There are extra articular manifestations with this condition. One of them is acute anterior uveitis. So the uvea is actually one of the layers in the eye and this becomes inflamed with this condition. Another eye finding is scleritis. So it's not like uveitis where we have inflammation even over the pupil in the iris. We only see it on the sclera of the eye, but you can see very reddened in erythematous areas. That is scleritis, so inflammation of the sclera of the eyes. We can also see aortic regurgitation, which can be a relatively severe manifestation of this condition because it can lead to structural heart change if not dealt with appropriately. We can also see apical interstitial lung disease, another severe manifestation. We can also see IgA or immunoglobulin A nephropathy with this condition, so the kidneys can be affected. And we can see inflammatory bowel disease with this condition as well. And we can see dermatological findings like psoriasis as well. So ankylosing spondylitis not only affects the spine and peripheral joints, but it can affect many other parts of the body as well due to its systemic inflammatory actions. These parts of the body can include the eyes, the aorta of the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the gastrointestinal system, and even the skin as well in the form of psoriasis. There are important radiological features in ankylosing spondylitis. So if we were to take a look in an x-ray and we look at the SI joint or the sacroiliac joint, we can see something termed pseudo-widening, pseudo-widening of the sacroiliac joint here. If we do an x-ray of the spine, we can see what we call squaring of edges or the shiny corner sign. So if you look here, these corners or these edges of the vertebrae are somewhat shiny. So you can see here where there's inflammation involved. And as this condition progresses, the bones can fuse and the spine can become something we know as bamboo spine. So here's an x-ray image of a typical bamboo spine. So when you look here, there's no separation of the vertebrae. They're all fused. When we see bamboo spine, this is a very key finding with ankylosing spondylitis. So if you ever hear bamboo spine, it is ankylosing spondylitis. How do we diagnose it? So diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis is generally through clinical special tests to check for sacroiliitis. One of the tests is the Faber test or Patrick's test, and that test is positive. So what an examiner does is that they flex the hip and the knee, they abduct the leg, and then they externally rotate, as you can see in this image here. If we get pain in the area of the sacroiliac joint, that is a positive test. There's also something we call the modified Schober's test, which is also positive in ankylosing spondylitis. This indicates decreased spinal range of motion. So generally what we do is that we make a mark at the dimples of venous, and we make a mark about 10 centimeters above the dimples, and then we get the patient to flex. So we get them to bend over to try to touch their toes, and then we measure out again, and that new measurement should be greater than 15 centimeters. So when we line up from the dimples to that 10 centimeter mark, it should actually be greater than 15 centimeters or at least 15 centimeters. If it's not, that is a positive test indicating a possible ankylosing spondylitis. So I know that's difficult to understand by just hearing it. So please look it up on other videos to see what it looks like. So those are two clinical tests indicating sacroiliitis with Faber's test and decreased spinal range of motion with the Schober's test indicating or increasing our suspicion of ankylosing spondylitis. So those can help with the diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis. But another way to make the diagnosis is by looking at how long they've had the back pain and when it started. So if they had lower inflammatory back pain that's been going on for greater than three months and that back pain started when they were less than 45 years of age, that is more likely to be ankylosing spondylitis. Again, lower inflammatory back pain. So inflammatory back pain, so pain with prolonged morning stiffness, worse at night, 
and gets better with activity. That doesn't completely give us the diagnosis, however. We still need to do some other testing. We can look at their HLA B27 status. If they're positive, that is it also another point toward making the diagnosis. And we have to look at x-ray findings. So if they have radiological findings that we talked about in the last slide, they do have classic ankylosing spondylitis. And without radiological findings, that is non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. So with radiological findings, that's a classic ankylosing spondylitis. Without radiological findings, that's non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. So two different things. But if they have no radiological findings, but they have at least four of the symptoms or clinical findings we talked about in the last couple of slides, then not the radiological findings, but the other findings like the inflammatory back pain, the emphysitis, acute anterior uveitis, or the scleritis, or the psoriasis, those types of symptoms or clinical findings, if they have at least four of those, then that is ankylosing spondylitis as well. So again, we want to look at how long they've had inflammatory back pain. It has to be at least three months with an onset less than 45 years of age. HLA B27 positive. If they have radiological findings, that's classic ankylosing spondylitis. Without radiological findings, we have to do a bit more work. It's non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. If we have at least four symptoms or four clinical findings we talked about before, that's an ankylosing spondylitis again. Again, it's not clear cut because some individuals with ankylosing spondylitis don't have HLA B27 positive. So it's a mix of all of these things that help us make the diagnosis. How do we treat it? So treatment of ankylosing spondylitis is started off with conservative measures. So the goal is to prevent or slow the progression of the spinal fusion. So one of those ways is through physiotherapy. So physiotherapy can help reduce some of that mechanical stress. It sounds counterintuitive, but physiotherapy can help build some of those paraspinal muscles and other muscles to help support the spine. Exercise, particularly swimming, can also help with this as well. Breathing exercises can also help, and quitting smoking can also help reduce some of the inflammatory process of this condition as well. With regards to pharmacological treatments, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs are the first-line therapy. So you can think of things like naproxen or celecoxib. And for a lot of patients, all they need is a high dose of NSAIDs to help them with their ankylosing spondylitis symptoms. But with prolonged high dose NSAIDs, we want to make sure that they're protected in other ways due to the side effects of NSAIDs. So we want to make sure they're on a proton pump inhibitor for gastrointestinal issues due to the NSAIDs. We also want to keep an eye on their blood pressure and their kidney function. For other patients that have other issues like peripheral arthritis, we can use disease-modifying agents, so DMARDs like methotrexate. And for patients that don't respond to NSAIDs and don't really respond to other treatments, we can use biologics. These are very expensive. Some of these include TNF-alpha inhibitors like golimumab. And then another class of biologics that can be used are the JAK1 inhibitors like upadacitinib. So if you want to learn more about other rheumatological conditions, please check out my rheumatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn. And I hope to see you next time.